A very good evening, uh, my dear friends and viewers. This is Dr. Suresh Shendu and welcome to Aspire 32. In uh, all of my recent podcast, uh, I have told you that uh, how you can go to different countries, get a license. Uh, maybe we have done some educational uh, videos on uh, Aspire 32, which can help you to prepare for various entrance exams. But today I have a special guest. Who, who can speak on uh, anything, whether it is related to how you can excel in the field of dentistry or you can become an excellent author writing various publications. And, uh, you know, maybe a great teacher because uh, he is everything and I'm glad and it's a privilege that we have Dr. Adit uh, with me on Aspire 32. And uh, I'm really looking forward uh, for this podcast because he's an amazing, uh, you know, practitioner. We all have been following him from uh, many months. And I want to thank Dr. Pavitra who connected me to Dr. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is how we could plan this uh, podcast. So first of all, uh, thank you for accepting our invite, Dr. Adit. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to host you on this podcast today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chenvi, and thank you, Aspire 32, for having me on your show. I'd like to thank Dr. Pavitra for introducing us as well. And uh, I am glad, and thank you for such a generous introduction. I'm just glad to be uh, contributing to uh, the lovely field and speciality uh, of yeah. orthodontics. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it is somewhere we are connected. You finished your uh, graduation from uh, Dawandir. And I'm curious to know because you know, everybody follows a conventional path, Dr. Adit Venugopal, and, uh, but you are, you are special. And that is how I want to go ahead with this session because, you know, you can, you can, we all know when we come out of graduation, we really don't know about the world, you know, we are protected and uh, I don't know whether we have, we had, or you had such a nice mentors. I'm sure you are, maybe you are, you were lost as we were, or I don't know, I want you to tell us that you know how did you how did you go ahead after your undergraduate because you went ahead and uh, did your ms in orthodontics from philippines and then you did your phd from south korea this is an unconventional amazing achievement can you just tell me or if you remember you know a brief way how how did all this work out or how did you give a thought what was that first thing which made you to take this step after your undergraduate uh, it's a wonderful question i get this uh, a lot so I very, very distinctively remember each and every thought process of mine. So uh, it was uh, 2010 and I had completed uh, uh, my internship. And I still remember it was August and we were supposed to finish everything in September. Uh, and uh, the common approach is all of India would know that we have CDs in Navangiri, which is run by Dr. Uh, Raisin Thomas. He's a very special mentor. And uh, I had joined CDs as well. So I had joined CDs for about a month. I think about a month or maybe just three sessions. I remember the starting three sessions that I've gone in for. And I was, uh, I was, I mean, my background is that I'm from an army family and um, I always wanted to join the army. And uh, I ended up uh, becoming, I, I, I didn't know it, but I was colorblind. So when I went in for my interviews in uh, medical, I was uh, graded uh, colorblind. And so I couldn't join the army uh, after finishing my dentistry. And so, uh, I, I was very confused. First of all, um, as I think the plight of many of us, uh, not most of us, many of us would be that I didn't know much. I didn't know much. Uh, I didn't know the practical nuances of dentistry after graduating dentistry. And uh, I started asking a lot of people, especially postgraduates, as to the common question is you really don't choose a specialty. In India, it's you're like a horse. <laughs> um, um, and, and you just have a unidirectional way based on your ranking. So that is a very wrong approach, is my idea. I mean, I do not go by that. and I would never enforce something like that. In India, it's something like you, after your dentistry, you just go in for your uh, scores, uh, you, you do your all India exams. And whatever scores that you get, depending on that, you choose your speciality. You're lucky if you get whatever speciality. You don't choose the speciality. Your marks choose your speciality. That's the problem here. So uh, at that particular time, I think endo was number one and the most wanted uh, subject. I still remember endo first because because of the random notion that uh, endo is the bread and butter. So we will all do endo. I mean, that was the notion. <laughs> so whether you're interested or not interested in endo is secondary. <laughs> it is like, it is a bread and butter. And then ortho, ortho was like, yeah, ortho gives you money. And surgery, you'll have to study a lot. 
probably eight or nine years, you'll have to end up studying, you'll have to do a lot of fellowships and so don't take surgery. I mean, it's a very long process. And uh, non-clinical subjects were like uh, the, the, the not wanted ones for some reason. So it was not uh, uh, interest oriented. It was just marks or uh, money or something of that sort. That, that, was, uh, that was the driving force behind the selection of the post graduation. And then I realized that this is, and then I started speaking with some professors and then I got to know that once in India, probably once you finish your post-graduation in whatever subject, you join a particular university, South India pay you uh, uh, relatively lesser. And by less, I mean almost nothing. I mean, it, it was, it was, it was honestly speaking peanuts. Uh, and then I, I wondered, what is the plight of dentistry in India? Then I totally gave up. I, I was, I was not a bad student. I was a good student. And, uh, uh, I, I would like to think that if I would have continued with CDs, I would have definitely gotten something or the other. But then, uh, in, in, in my third session, I told uh, Sir that I think I'm going to give up on this. I'm not interested in this anymore. I would like to look up some options abroad. And then I started doing my own research. Uh, I, I started actually looking at uh, clinic websites and uh, some uh, pictures and advertisements. And then I realized that orthodontics, I, I was never very good with surgery. I mean, you get to know. Right, you're, yeah. Are you a good surgeon or are you a good diagnostician or what is it like? And that's how yes. even you choose a medical yeah, subject. I, I remember I, I could never straighten the wire, so I, I always knew. Neither, neither could I. Neither could I. Neither could I. Okay. I could. I could. I, I was very bad at all. Okay. But then uh, that is not what uh, drove me towards ortho. Hmm. I knew that I'm a bad surgeon, so I didn't want to go into translocational surgery and then doing all those things. Then what interested me is the changes that orthodontics brought about to the face. Not looking at uh, micro aesthetics or mini aesthetics in particular. I'm talking about the macro aesthetic point of view uh, that we look into ortho, and uh, that appealed to me a lot. And then I decided that okay, fine. Now I would like to do ortho. Now, which is the best place to do ortho? Uh, the US and uh, the West was uh, out of question for me, um, uh, primarily because of the investment that was um, uh, that was that was going to be uh, into into that. And uh, then is when I started looking at some programs. I started asking different different uh, professors and different people in all the context, what, uh, what, is, what is it that makes you choose a particular institution abroad? And then I realized that there are very few institutions which follow something called as the standard edgewise protocol, or maybe the Charles Tweed uh, Foundation uh, protocol in all the context, which is a very primitive, orthodox way of practicing. Not, uh, not that primitive. <laughs> um, uh, but then it is, uh, it is the foundation of ortho. And once you know the standard edgewise way, uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but then it is, it's a hard way of learning ortho. And once you learn that, everything else is a cakewalk. And then we had these uh, professors from Japan, and then we had uh, a lot of clinical work, and it's very different from an Indian way of teaching. It's modular, semester-wise. They don't really pressurize you. It's up to you. Uh, as to if you want to learn, you will learn a lot. And then we had these didactics, and then we had these uh, practical programs, and then we had labs, and we had crazy amount of work. I did a lot of work there. And then, I, uh, the best part, uh, I mean, very different from India, is that we get to go for a lot of these international conferences, CDE programs. Uh, in India, I'm sure they, you, you can't just uh, tell your professor that I want to go to uh, US for this 11-day course in between your uh, PG. But there you could. There you could. And so, of course, the money's out of your pocket. Go if you would. And I went, you won't believe, I went for about seven or eight international conferences workshop during my post-graduation. And uh, I learned a lot. So what gave me the exposure is seeing different countries and the way they worked and what they were best at. Now, during one of my conferences in Thailand, I was presenting this paper and I knew about the Professor Lee Moon Kyu uh, from Korea. And he was, the, uh, he, was, uh, he, was, he was a pioneer in the field of temporary anchorage devices. And he was the one who actually developed the first mini schools as well. And uh, I immediately knew that I want to do something I want to train under him. Uh, after my conference, he was one of the uh, one of the panelists of my uh, oral presentation that I had, and I remember I was presenting a case on distalization that I had uh, recently finished in my post graduation, my second year something, and then he appreciated it a lot. And immediately, I I I, I went and spoke to him. I just congratulated him on his research and how much I've learned from him. And then he said that, "Would you like to work? Would you like to probably do your research with us?" And I said, "Of course. I mean, this is this is exactly why uh, I had approached you." Uh, I wanted to uh, train, my, uh, train myself and uh, I just didn't want to do a fellowship or something. I wanted to do a proper program, you know, nothing, nothing better than a PhD. 
he was like okay fine uh, let's let's do that and uh, in my third year as soon as i finished i already set up my phd so as soon as i finished my phd uh, my masters i waited for the interim gap uh, because there is an intake summer and spring intake so i had to wait for about 2 3 months i immediately jumped to korea i started my post graduation uh, my phd research fellowship over there on a scholarship uh, where uh, i uh, developed a mini screw with uh, a nano silver coating around it Uh, which helped with uh, inflammation, anti-inflammatory properties, and antimicrobial properties, as well as increasing the primary stability and secondary stability indirectly. Um, we tested a few bacteria, like, uh, Streptococcus mutans and Staphylococcus aureus, and Porphyromonas gingivalis, which which were very common in the gingival flora. So yeah, that that was my beginning of interest in research. And of course, uh, I am a staunch believer that nobody is an academician in dentistry. We are all clinicians. Dentistry is a clinical field. It's wrong to say that we are academicians. <laughs> Whatever we do is for clinics. It's, it's for patient in turn. So I mean, we are all clinical. We are all clinical people. We do research because we are scientists. We want to we want to find out more, and that's why we do research. And we want to inculcate that in our uh, patient benefits, and that's that's why we conduct research. And uh, so yes, I would like to think that I'm a clinician as well as a researcher. and uh, that was my entire journey and uh, i don't i don't regret any bit of uh, anything uh, because whatever that i have done has gotten me where i am and i'm lucky that i was trained by many great people and they have had a great building aspect great uh, um, uh, great great amount of uh, impact on where i am today so uh, that's of course you know you almost uh, told your entire journey here and it is quite inspiring i am sure uh, you know the way you say it it appears as if uh, you know everything was uh, very a uh, cake walk but i i don't know i don't know it was i truly I believe you know. maybe at every every stage were uncertain maybe okay because uh, i know you know whenever we are trying because uh, we have so much of uncertainties in the in our country that in spite of as you said you know at the beginning that you know you want to do a branch uh, you may or you may not do it uh, of course you know that is something which is difficult to change i don't know when it will change here but settling uh, for something less is something that is not uh, it's it's absolutely not done if you want to do something just because your marks are not enough for that if you settle for something lesser you have compromised on your life absolutely absolutely i completely agree with that because uh, you know ultimately uh, that history you know for 2 3 years 3 4 years it will be maybe about earning but then it will be like daily you are working you have to enjoy no, no, otherwise it's a absolutely. boring it's a boring job it's a boring job very true so very true. so uh, because you have mentioned that you were able to reach at so many places uh, but how how easy was it? for example as you know that you yourself know that you have to do something in united states Uh, of course it's a financial issue but it is also like they may not accept you you know there is uh, directly you may have to go to us and do all those things i just wanted to know because i'm sure some of the people, students who are looking this podcast to get inspired by you may also want to go in in this path or create something like this so what what is the whole process like you know how do the people apply for foreign universities and get accepted actually now what happens is this not a very easy procedure as, as you've already mentioned and uh, you you yourself uh, clear the national boards so you are familiar with the pathways now it's even harder which is very hard see a bds going to the us and getting a dds is easy you have to clear your national boards and then uh, you have to apply to many universities and the procedure is like at least one or two would take you based on whatever scores you have in your undergrad if not you will have to go in for some advanced training over there in one of the few colleges or universities get some training from us which will add on to your impact on your cv and then eventually you will get it in one of these uh you have to really do good in your undergrad because those marks and your gpa counts it really matters it really matters now next step suppose you do your masters in india and now you want to go out doing a masters in the west and canada and the us is a little harder you don't need to do your dds to do your masters you can directly get into your masters program as an international student but then they looking for research you need publications because your profile has to be balanced 
you have to have some uh, publications. They look in for publications before they would take you into a master's program. Well, I have had uh, a few friends who, who have gotten into some certain universities without any research background, but uh, I know 90% of them wouldn't take you. You will have to have some publications, and not, not just publications in paid journals. That's another topic altogether. It has to be peer reviewed, proper peer reviewed indexed journals, probably something called a scoop is or med. We have those indexing factors. Uh, quota is Q1, Q2. So you need to have them in very legitimate peer reviewed journals. And that really, really improves your chances of getting into a master's program. Of course, it's the same for PhD. Uh, you can directly apply for a PhD program. There are many universities which have a PhD program in. And uh, you have an integrated master's with PhD. Sometimes you have just a PhD, which is a five-year program. Uh, and then you have these certificate with master's, certificate with PhD. Now, these certificates are nothing but residency programs, which are like master's in India. So they don't really have something called this master's of research. In India, it's, it's, all, uh, it's all mixed up. In, in India, you have an MDS, which is a research come clinical facility. You have both integrated. But in most of the other countries, it's, it's very clearly demarcated. A certificate program is a residency program. An associated master's program is an exclusive research program. So it's something like that. So it's always a master's with certificate or it's a certificate alone. Right? And most of the international students, they have to mandatory, they have to do a master's with the, with the certificate. You can't just do a certificate unless you have a DDS and they have these small nuances here and there. Uh, PhD is not that easy. In the US uh, or in any part of the world, like I did it in South Korea, Japan, it's not very easy. It has very less to do with your academic uh, or scholastic uh, report from, from, from your previous courses, for example, from your undergrad or from your master's. The GPU doesn't really count. You need to have a good rapport with your probable advisor. And you need to have a very strong research proposal in your head. More importantly, you can't just go to, okay, let me give you an example. For example, I am very interested in robotics, nano robots, robotics. And I want to do my PhD under Himul Kyung in South Korea, which does not, they don't publish or they don't do anything on nano robots. They do everything on mechanics and screws. It's not a good fit. Now, even though I want to do it under him, he will not take me because he does the, 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 the particular facility does not do this kind of research. You get my point, right? So you will have to really search universities and professors who, who have a similar mindset and research uh, interest as you have. Then you go to their every university, top university, I mean, they have a research tab on their website. You go and see the researches which are done, recently published. Or you can just put the professor's name on ResearchGate, you'll find all his publications. Try to identify whom you relate to. Prepare uh, a research paradigm or research proposal, which consists of uh, aim, materials and methods, uh, probable objectives, and uh, what kind of results or hypothesis that you're looking at. Present it to him. With, just ask him, just talk with him. And if he's interested, and if their department do something similar, they will call you. Because they know that this guy's research is aligned with our department facility slash grants. The PhD has to lock to do the grants again, which is a little mixed up in India. In India now it's become again a horse race, where now everybody wants to do a PhD because everybody is a master's. So now everybody wants to do a PhD because that's the way you can go up the academic ladder. I believe you need to do a PhD. You need to do a PhD only if you're interested in research, or else there's no point. You're not doing justice <laughs> to your research. I mean, it has to be logical here. Uh, it, you need a grant. Like for me, nano materials and nano silver was not manufactured in an orthodontic department, right? The mini screws were through a company, of course, which was Dentos, Abso Anchor. So our department had to procure mini screws, which are 300, 400, 500 mini screws or whatever implants from the manufacturer, which was again associated with my professor because he's one of the owners of Abso Anchor. So that was easy. But then how, how do we get the nano silver deposited on that? So I needed to get in collaboration with the Department of Nanomaterials, Polymer Chemistry. So I went there, I talked to them, I told the head of department that this is my proposal, I want a grant, I want a joint grant. And then they thought about it, they said, probably, what are we going to get out of it? Because every department wants publications. Some use. They're like, okay, once this project is done, we would want to publish some in exclusive chemistry journals. You can publish the primary result in orthodontics. I said, okay. And then our professors met. And then they decided on a grant. 
because nano silver production involves money. Uh, you can't just produce nano silver like that in that large quantity, right? So you need you need money, and then deposition, SEM, FEM, atomic force microscopy. All of this needs a lot of money, <laughs> and uh, yes. Yeah, so then you have a huge grant, fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars, which is funded by the university, just to know or just in the hope that this project is going to come out well and something good is come, going to come out of it. And our university is going to get a lot of publications through this particular project. And that is how it works. And then finally, we have a contract, we have a sign, we have a grant, which is a grant between the Department of Orthodontics and the Polymer Chemistry, Nanochemistry. And then we have this entire thing and then we start our project. And we are involved. There are some postgraduates in chemistry. There are some postgraduates in ortho. And then we make our own stuff and we write our papers. And inclined towards chemistry gets published in chemistry. Inclined towards ortho gets published in ortho. And that's how we work. And that's what a PhD is. You need to make a difference to the society through your research. You can't just do something for the heck of doing it. And what is the difference between a master's research and a PhD research? How is a PhD research different from a master's research? You're doing a research in master's as well. You're doing the same research in PhD as well. So what is different? Why are you getting a PhD here? So you can just do a master's again. So this is the difference, more longitudinal. The, the essence is not to do a thesis. That is master's. The essence is to make a difference, to, to innovate. That is what a PhD is. And then you have a public difference in which anybody can come and sit down. You have a fall, anybody comes and sits down from polymer chemistry, from nanochemistry, imagine an orthodontist defending in front of polymer chemistry, nanochemistry, and you will get bombarded with stuff in your public defense. And you have to answer those questions. And then is when you're awarded the title for PhD. So it's a very prestigious thing. And uh, I'm saddened that in the current state of affairs, it's made a mockery out of it. <laughs> so, why, why, do you think, why do you think uh, uh, this situation has happened uh, in, in our country uh, that, uh, you know, things like what you said, uh, of course, it may not be easier, but uh, uh, I'm sure you might have got a lot of support, funding, the universities may be very, you know, I think they will not give you, you know, money so easily, but maybe they were a bit streamlined. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you suggest to, uh, you know, maybe people in India or, you know, who can get some changes? What do you think, what changes are needed in, you, maybe you are a field of orthodontics in India. It's very, it's very simple, Dr. Shri. In India, what has happened is, everybody wants to go up the ladder. Now, one fine day, if the Dental Council of India puts a rule that every professor has to become a PhD, everybody will start doing a PhD. Right? And that is exactly what has happened. Now, you start finding alternatives of how to do a PhD. Now, somebody starts doing a part-time PhD. Somebody starts doing a five-year PhD, three-year PhD. You can't do a part-time five-year PhD being a professor, being this, being that, because then you're doing four, five things together. You have to concentrate on one thing. Now that, I don't know. I mean, then the people will start having a problem because they will have to quit their professorship, continue their PhD and again rejoin. Nobody wants to do that because they're going to lose money. So they've started this alternative of a part-time PhD in which they're finishing a PhD in five, six years. And I am starting to see some of the projects which are, which are, I mean, which are almost master's theses, very similar to master's. And you've just taken five years to do that. And nobody even knows that you're doing a PhD. One fine day you just come up with it, oh, I finished my PhD. So, so, so all this is, all this is the, 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 the situation. You people have to have clear cut guidelines because research is fundamental to the development of health. We cannot, we cannot go doing it. Tomorrow, for example, COVID, if we know that, uh, if tomorrow, if, if I come and just tell you that, okay, fine, well, let's start using uh, X medicine for this, would you believe me? I mean, imagine, imagine uh, someone of the way we are talking, a PhD in the field of medicine starts just doing a PhD and come, comes out with this uh, finding and publishes it in some XYZ journal and we start following that and some dies. Who is responsible? We need to have, uh, we need to have responsibility. This is not learning stuff. You need to be responsible because tomorrow, if I have said that nano silver reduces inflammation on a mini screw and Dentos is manufacturing that, and tomorrow, if something happens, if that nano silver goes into your fibroblasts and uh, destroys your fibroblasts, for example, there is a particular size, 70 nanometers, which is small enough to get into the cell wall of a microbe, but not small enough to get into the fibroblast. Now, you get the difference, right? Or else the silver is going to destroy your fibroblasts. And what if that happens? So 
these are the things which which are important and this is your research integrity that is the point so it is not about the guidelines the guidelines are right professors all over the world need a phd if you want to join a university phd is a norm how you do it nobody can tell you you need to have the integrity to do that properly and if you want to take 6 years if you just want to continue your clinics from morning to morning to evening you're working in a hospital uh, in a university in the evening we go to the clinics and do a consulting and then one fine day after 5 years we say phd is over that's what you <laughs> true words and i'm sure uh, you know it is the researcher and your you know your experience which is speaking uh, here and i really respect it uh, you said uh, that of course these type of things are a bit difficult in india but suppose uh, you know if undergraduate students you mentioned that uh, you know maybe they would need publication do you still feel an undergraduate can go abroad and uh, you know is it possible even today but if you say yes how will an undergraduate student uh, you know get into research i'm sure they're capable of what is your suggestion if they if they have because maybe in 100 one or 1000 or 10000 students who are watching this there may be one one student who wants to become dr adip and uh, or maybe follow his path what is your suggestion to him and to do something at undergraduate level what is your advice to him so that he can I excel mean, you you like you i used to think the same i used to be a i mean i finished my bds and uh, i realized that how can an undergrad ever do research but i'm sure you know that everybody else apart from us in south asia do research as a component in their dds as a dds always has an undergraduate thesis it is a must that's a requirement to graduate so apart from us everybody else is already doing a research <laughs> so it is not hard for them they have already done their research and now it is a matter of publishing it so we will have to write it up properly we will have to collaborate with maybe your professors this is where your professors are going to help you of course you as an independent undergrad in your final year you're not capable enough of just going into a peer review journal and knowing everything and writing it up and all those things so it's understood somebody has to help you with the proper research guidance so your professors should be right there to partner up with you to maybe collaborate with two of your undergrads and that's what i do i mean i usually couple up uh, two or three students together the dentistry student and that's how we do it three or four i think five now five undergrads do one thesis makes sense it is probably here probably here see suppose you you are dds dds 6 and 7 no no i understand i understand that but suppose uh, you are a teacher in india you are already a teacher you know you are associated with savita as a adjunct professor mm-hmm. there i'm sure you are mm-hmm. guiding students there uh which year do you think student should be we are doing it at our our institute also i really want students to do something else apart from that uh, conventional study which year do you think we should be motivating them uh, to get into research i think what i think in india it is best is uh, final year to internship the transition over there is the best time because an internship uh, yeah i i don't think people really do much uh, so mm-hmm. apart from apart from the people who actually want to learn clinical stuff but i yeah. really think it is uh, it is more of uh, a journey uh, in a transition and i don't think we really do much we don't put our time to the use so i think that is the best time to conduct high quality research uh, and five in a group is not big it's not it's not tough five people doing a thesis together is easy and all you have to do is do a cross sectional study who is asking them to do a longitudinal study just do a small cross sectional study which is pertinent not something outdated or just for the sake of doing something which is at their level something which can be studied within patients within the cohort that you have available maybe they could do a review the review does not take much you could do a literature review isn't it now of course a final year guy is not going to know what a literature review or a systematic review or a meta analysis or a uh, or, or or different kinds of reviews are so this is where the professors come they will tell you this is the outline take this paper as your guideline take this paper take these 10 papers read uh, think of it come back to me next week with a research proposal read these 10 papers come back to me with a research proposal i'll tell you whether it is feasible or not feasible come back with four different ideas i'll tell you what is possible what is not possible if you have too many variables this is impossible you can't do this just do one variable let's do this let's do this make sense and then do this fresh and it just takes a month or maybe two months to complete a study a cross section of simple stuff and then you have a good two months to write it up write up write up take this paper as a guidance write it up come back we will we'll do things we will edit it we will edit it five months you can have a beautiful paper ready for submission to you we don't need to go in for a q1 proper nature level publication but you can get it published and that's your starting 
and that is what you need um, in order to apply elsewhere. Research which is done is important. It is not hard. It is easy, but the culture should set in. True. I think uh, we we are heading in that direction. But you say, as you said, it it may it may take some time. But uh, I genuinely understand what you are saying. There are so many things which can actually be changed. Uh, for example, I as a practitioner, you know, I feel loops are something which should be started from second BDS in India. We are still stuck with that same, uh, you know, amalgam preparation where they can't see. You know, you tell them, okay, this is the bevel. This has to. The I don't. In spite of teaching more and more, I don't know why students are understanding less and less. This is as a teacher I feel. Uh, but I think yes, there are there are things which have been changing in at least good universities and at Kale University we are we do try to motivate students. You have done a lot of publication, Doctor Adit, and uh, you are well known. Very high impact journals, uh, collaborations. There is uh, you know there is a big list of your publications. uh what what will be the five things uh which can help someone to do good publications you know do you have any certain tips to them you know when they are just beginning with the write up of because i know everybody struggles i you know to write the literature what is your suggestion to them or is there any something some some sites or Shall some we, information it's important see there are many categories of publication we need to get on to that first are opinion papers then we have case reports then we have uh, original studies original research randomized control trials and systematic reviews and meta analysis now the last three are slightly difficult to understand literature reviews opinion papers case reports are easy to read and understand comprehend to read a paper you need to know how to read a paper you can't just go and read a randomized control trial so if you ask an undergrad or a first year postgraduate to go read a randomized control trial you will not understand what is happening for that you need to know statistics for that you need to know what statistics are and what is used what is the interpretation so you need to have a sound basis in undergrad which we don't have number one in masters we start having uh, exposure we start getting exposure to research methodology statistics design and understanding all that but i think that this has to be integrated in your undergrad for some level for some level as well uh, once somebody knows how to read a paper there has to be a study club i mean we do that we have something called as a study club where we give some certain papers to students to read and come back and present it so it's like general present what we have in our post graduation exactly. okay. but post graduation now yeah. you want it to be kept for under graduation minimal level minimal level and just one very nice suggestion it's a very nice suggestion yes uh, because that is how you will learn I mean, you can't read a paper you can't say are you please start go uh, start going and read, start, start start reading papers they be like because oh, i don't understand this i don't know what to see in this this is too complicated for me so we you can't expect them to uh, see i mean what they never seen before or understand what they don't know so that's that's the logic here and uh, you can have those things and that is once you start reading paper once you start reading current papers i find them more important than books and in my practical uh, knowledge and uh, expertise i have uh, learned far more than uh, uh, far more from papers than textbooks uh, once you read a lot of papers you automatically know uh, the literature flow and and how to write a paper then it is a matter of starting it's a, it's a, it's a starting trouble and once you write your first case report you can write any case report once you write your first original article original articles are still a little difficult here and there because the body can keep changing but then um, it's a matter of starting you can start with case reports and then you can jump into the other difficult modalities but uh, it is a must you you must read papers and automatically you will start uh, writing it of course english is of paramount importance here uh, we have a lot of english editing services so i do understand not everybody is perfect with english in this situation. it's not necessary to even expect something of that sort but then uh, once you write a paper you can give it for english editing we have many different services and uh, they would properly format your paper um, do you suggest any anything which uh, how much generally uh, do you do you know the charges of it uh, any idea how much they range i think if you take a one year subscription or something it's about uh, 500 dollars okay 500 dollars that's about 30000 rupees for one year 
and it's not too much it's not too much so a department can easily uh, fund you for this and uh, imagine having a one year subscription for about 30000 bucks and then you can have about 10 publications going and it's a win it's a win and uh, once you do that you have a lot of it and uh, you can get a good quality paper out of it to free it again and again and uh, submit it and then it's not in your hands <laughs> so then it's the then it's up to the editors sometimes you get an editorial rejection right away sometimes um, they send it for peer review most of the times and uh, usually there are about three peer reviews two say yes one says no it's accepted if two say no one says yes, it's not accepted so i've had more rejections of course than acceptance and everybody does i think my uh, acceptance to rejection rate is, acceptance rate is just maybe about 30% uh, 70% are rejections and i think that is normal i think it's absolutely so once you become an editor uh, you get the knack of uh, knowing where to submit what uh, or or not not where to i mean once you become a little experienced in this, you exactly know where to submit what and uh, that will uh, that will reduce your wastage of time with the rejections so, so i mean comes with experience but then you must start you, you cannot i have had a lot of these people saying i don't have time uh, it's 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 wrong it's absolutely you're just fooling yourself when you say that you don't have time i mean you always have time i i for example do about 40 orthotonic cases a day and in between i even write papers i do not work at home so it's a matter of finding time you don't need to just write a paper on one day it can take about a month or maybe two months to write that particular paper we can just sit and just do it that's your interest if you're interested in something you will find time for it you are currently working in uh, cambodia and uh, what is your lay, day like dr radit how how is your day uh, and i stopped working in the clinic at about 9 o'clock uh, and uh, i worked till say 12 o'clock and then we have a lunch break for about an hour and then i stopped working at about 1:15 or and i worked till about 5 that's all i do not work a minute more than that because uh, uh, i will because i think it is important to manage it that way uh, your family needs you, you as well right so i wouldn't give one minute extra to uh, take out my family time for my work time or take out my work time for my family this ethics has to be deeply instilled inside you so i have had people who say let's work till 5:30 there is this extra patient there are these patients there are that patient keep coming i mean you put that work ethic and people will exploit you we do not the aesthetic um, group of practitioners i mean we we develop the aesthetics and I'm, I'm, i'm pretty sure that we don't have emergencies in our field in my 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 specialty so i don't i don't see the see the need of uh, unless it's it's really important or something i mean i do make my exceptions over there but, but otherwise five o'clock is the end for me and then it's a family and then i don't i don't do anything Uh, from that particular time it's all with my kid with my dog with the uh, wife and then we just spend some time together i sleep late i sleep very late um, i i spend a lot of time on social media which which may be wrong and right <laughs> because uh, no, but I, this is one thing which uh, you know which i wanted to mention you know you have been very uh, it's a very nice post which you put very professional way and i'm sure that they are very educational people who are watching this podcast should follow dr adit on linkedin and i'm sure he is there on facebook uh, there are thousands of followers everywhere on this page uh, this there is one thing dr adit you know which i am also very active on uh, social media uh, we also share cases but there are few people who may say that you know this is not a right way for because this is what i heard a lot this is not a right way of learning uh, by you know looking at the post on social media but i strongly believe on the you know the power of social media where the people can learn things uh, from amazing people like you how is the social media helped you to educate reaches the mass and how it has helped you to grow as an individual dr i have written about this very issue in one of my publications uh, called credibility versus popularity in uh, avus and um, where i was i was this person uh, he threw a lot of cases and then one of my friends dr asim he told me you doing such beautiful cases why don't you put them on these wonderful groups i mean there are a lot of orthodontists who would probably criticize you and uh, 
that you appreciate you as well and at the same time you're going to get some confidence you're going to get some better ideas of how to work around it i was apprehensive and i think that is the main uh, issue over here many of us are very apprehensive as to what people are going to say um, uh, they'll make a mockery out of me they'll embarrass me i'll embarrass myself maybe my work is not up to the mark again it's just a beginner's itch i did that somehow getting all my confidence and my first case i was bashed Uh, somebody told me that uh, oh why did you extract in this case you reduce the airway and blah 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 and uh, there were some supporters uh, there were some people who went against me criticized me a lot but then it was okay it was okay i mean you're putting your work on social media so you you have to expect uh, you can't just expect roses so you you <laughs> you're going to have you're going to have people who will talk uh, about criticize as well so you have to take opinions as simple as that and then i started to thing more and more and more and more and more and then uh, i started associating that with some literature and then uh, now i think i have more uh, appreciation than criticism uh, it's not because of the popularity it's about a learning curve yeah. i'm sure you know about the dunning kruger's effect in the beginning you think you know everything but then when you go the curve with some experience you realize that you don't know anything because you start seeing the bad results of what you've done and then with the experience you start to try to correct that correct that correct that and finally you reach an end where you can say now i have seen everything so that's a dunning kruger effect and everybody goes through that once you finish your pg you think you know everything about your thing this is really true this is really and then true. after 5 years of of experience you realize that you don't know anything <laughs> and then uh, things happen so so that happened with me and it's very important to be on social media because uh, uh, people in the past didn't have this medium nothing wrong in using a medium which can voice your opinion to millions of people around the world uh, our previous generation did not have this uh, facility we have this facility you'd be fools not to use it uh, uh, the reach social media has nothing has nothing no publication no journal no nothing can reach yes you might you might end up saying oh this information is not peer reviewed true it is not peer reviewed but then you have a lot of peers commenting on it and then you're just showcasing it you're not claiming it to be a fact or you're not claiming a, a research on social media you're just putting forward your cases and you're showcasing your work for the world maybe for appreciation maybe for criticism maybe for learning maybe for marketing yourself whatever nothing is wrong as long as you do it uh, for yourself nothing is wrong you shouldn't be embarrassed of doing anything very nice words and uh, I, i'm sure that uh, people those people who listen to it would definitely take at least one step in showcasing their work in a very positive way now i i i know we almost one hour now since we are talking and uh, i have last few questions to you because i already taken a lot of time yours, no of yours of no yours uh if if you became uh, you know if you if you become the in charge of uh, you know something like making a syllabus or something you get a power to change something in orthodontics in india what what would be what would be those as i mentioned i would uh, i would have put in a very practical approach i'm not going to change the uh, education system in india i think it is just fine it is just fine it, but it is the mindset it is the mindset that needs to be changed the syllabus need not be changed it is the motivation it is the kind of motivation you need in terms of what you want to do after becoming an orthodontist it shouldn't just be becoming a professor or become becoming an assistant professor in the same university and then uh, it should be contributing towards it one thing i've noticed is uh, continuous medical education or dental education is uh, lacking it's not it's not very very advanced i think uh, the post graduates uh, should be given a lot of leeway to learn many things and i think we should leave behind many things that are redundant what i've noticed in india is we still hold on to things like removable appliances and pegs and all those things i don't know why i've still heard that many many institutions do pegs mm-hmm. okay. uh, they're all redundant i mean i in my entire pra- practice i have never used a single removable appliance or anything whatsoever in orthodontics and um, aligners are a new trend i'm sure they're going to be incorporated into the uh, uh, trends uh, more more um, intent towards research is needed and good quality research is needed uh, publication ethics is something that is very very important um, 
it's not a rat race. I see so many publications by Indian dentists in uh, 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 in in uh, what do you call these uh, predatory journals? We call them predatory journals. These are journals which just publish your stuff no matter what by taking money, and you claim to be a published researcher, but you're actually not because they would publish anything. And, uh, these things must change. Yeah. So more intent and more concentration with the research and let aside what is redundant and concentrate more on what is current. Uh, that's, that's, that's more of what I think should be done in orthodontics especially because it is a very clinical specialty and uh, you don't need too much of theory the way I see it but uh, more concentration on papers, less on books, textbooks per se, more on current papers. Uh, these are some things that I would, I, I already do that in, uh, where I teach, but then uh, I think um, everybody would benefit out of, out of all these things. Yes, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, at least the things which I've learned from you, I will try to incorporate at least in a small way. But last question, uh, Dr. Adit, what, what are your hobbies? What are your hobbies? Okay, so I love playing uh, racket games. I've been... Uh, uh, I've been a national uh, uh, squash player and uh, badminton, and I play tennis as well. And uh, I, I I love playing with my dog. I have a beagle and my um, baby girl. She's two years and eight months now, and uh, they take up everything else. I think I think one of the hobbies which 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 always remained uh, incomplete was uh, learning the violin. I wanted to always learn a musical instrument. The violin always appealed to me, but I had never the chance or the time to devote uh, to learning the violin. But yes, apart from that, my day just goes on smooth. And, uh, I try to play maybe just once or twice a week, somehow when I get time. The rest of the time, yeah, I just get back and my baby and the dog and my wife and everybody just finish the day. <laughs> it's amazing listening to you, Dr. Adit. And, uh... This, uh, you know, it was an intense discussion and, uh, uh, you know, I know it will be a, it's a serious discussion, but you have spoken from your heart and you care for the education, uh, not just orthodontist, every dentist who is coming out of uh, the universities, it is your care which is speaking for them. And I sincerely respect your, uh, you know, every word. It, it's, it's amazing listening to you and hopefully we'll meet you one day personally and get to learn more from you about, you know, listen to your presentations, maybe in some conferences. Thank you so much for giving me your valuable time and uh, your, uh, you know, uh, vision for uh, the dentistry in India. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shindy, for having me. I congratulate the entire team. I congratulate you for having this wonderful channel, which helps uh, budding dentists and uh, experienced dentists at the same time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to the audience uh, for spending their time listening to me. Thank you.